Alexandra Keating is a serial entrepreneurista and the founder of Uni, a skincare company that is designed for you, but made for the planet. After a visit home to Australia, Alexandra became passionate about creating a company that combined top of the line skincare with sustainable packaging solutions. Today, Uni can be found in luxury hotels across the US. Coming up, how Alexandra started Australia's largest fundraising platform while she was still in college. We were sort of the first people to collect money for charities. The unique strategy she takes to grab customers' buy-in instead of leading with sustainability. Our product is best in class, super sustainable, and it can teach you how to do things differently. How Alexandra was able to get Ashton Kutcher as an investor in her business. They were like, we're not investing pre-launch. <laughs> we're not investing on a piece of paper, but if you build it, come back, maybe we will. And finally, you'll learn about her gifting strategy for their launch. We're doing a lot of whitelisting at the moment, so we organically gift a lot. Alexandra shares insight on current market conditions for raising capital. The more time you spend with them, the more you understand what their interests are, what they're going to do with the business. AK, I am so thrilled to sit down with you today to hear all about your entrepreneurista journey and story. And before we just hit record, you were mentioning to me you've started multiple companies over the years. So I really want to hear how your story started. Did you always know growing up that you wanted to have your own business one day? I think so. I mean, I was quite, quite kind of an entrepreneurial child. Um, but my first company is called Go Fundraise. It's uh, it's like kind of like a first giving or just giving, I think you have in the UK and America. Uh, and we were sort of the first people to collect money for charities. So charities at that point didn't have their own websites. They didn't have payment gateways. Everything was done through checks and cash donations sent in the mail. So for me, trying to raise money for the Breast Cancer Foundation was an impossible task. And then also once I got the money, they didn't really tell me how it was being spent. And so what I wanted to do was create a platform where we could easily collect, but also would have some sort of accountability where we would be able to measure and understand like where those dollars were going. Uh, and now it's amazing. I mean, it's one of Australia's largest fundraising platforms and I'm like, you know, really thrilled to have been a part of it, but I didn't really know what I was doing. I was like a self-taught coder, like just kind of figuring it out and putting notices around the universities and trying to get people just to help me. Uh, so we definitely are the definition of bootstrapped with that one. Yeah. I mean, I just started building it cause I knew I needed to build it. So it was kind of like asking people if they could help me out or if I could, you know, feed them pizza for like looking at what I was building and things like that. And then at the same time, just kind of trying to find families or friends or anyone that was interested that could like help us, you know, put some money into it. I think the whole time, I think we raised like $30,000 or something. So like, obviously not very much, but, um, one of the biggest hurdles I had is the charities all thought I was like, you know, going to con them or they were, you know, they didn't want to be available online. They didn't want credit card information. So it was actually got to a point where I just listed it and I listed all the top charities. And then I call them and be like, I have, you know, 5000 or $10,000 for you. Do you want it or should I send it back? And then once I got over that hurdle, then it was really easy. But in the beginning, everyone was like, no, 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 we don't want it. You can't list us, you know. Um, wow. And so that's how I, that's how I got over it. And I guess in a way I sort of became like a growth marketer, you know, mm -hmm. accidentally. And that's how I traded myself when I came to the US. What year was it that you started that business? Oh God. I mean, it would have been probably like 15 years ago or something, maybe okay. even longer. No, 18 years ago. So like a long time. Yeah. Isn't it just so wild to think about now nonprofits being like, no, 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 we don't want to be online. And now it's like, if you're not online, like how are you raising any money for, for your nonprofit? Yeah. It was actually in the end, then they would start to call me and we had like a separate sort of revenue stream where we would basically spin up these sites because they, you know, were starting to send traffic to us just to catch like online, you know, donations and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was a cool time. What happened with that business? It ended up selling to like some Macquarie, which is like one of the banks in Australia. So one, like a bunch of those guys. And I think they still run it today. What was the process of selling your business like? It was a hard thing. I mean, I think because we, you know, we were so bootstrapped, it was really stressful. And actually my dad, I was like, oh, I think someone wants to buy it. And my dad was like, you should, you know, darling, it's very hard to sell things, you know, you should definitely, you know, get out of it kind of thing. And then I remember when he came to, you know, I asked him to help me, you know, drive down to the office and pick up all my belongings. And 
he was like, wow, what is this place? And what are all these desks? And who are these people? And I was like, oh, they're our employees. And he had never actually realized like how big we were or what we'd really accomplished. So that was kind of like, he was like, maybe you shouldn't have done it, but it was, you know, too late at that point. (laughs) But I, you know, it's so, it's so stressful. I can understand why he didn't, you know, he wanted me to, to get out of it. How many years were you running that business before you decided to sell? I think it would have been like a couple of years. I can't, oh my God, it's so long. I haven't thought about it in a long time. But yeah, I would probably say like three or four years or something like that. Any advice you can share for founders who are thinking about selling their business or in the process of selling their business, what they should think about or know before they put their business up for sale or go through a transaction? Any learning lessons you can share? In most cases, I've seen usually the person who they thought was going to acquire the business acquired the business. And my advice to anyone and what also what we do is we spend a lot of time with the acquirers beforehand. It's a bit like fundraising, like the more time you spend with them, the more you understand what their interests are, what they're going to do with the business. Uh, and then the the sale process is really about getting the best dollar. So you can, once you kind of know that you can run a competitive process, you'll probably get a better deal for yourself. But ultimately, in most cases, I feel like it goes to the person who uh, was most likely and most interested in buying it. Can you explain what you mean by running a competitive process and what that looks like? I would say the same as fundraising in general. Um, I know a lot of people have different sort of approaches to that. To me, I sort of feel like it's a scheduling um, process. And so I like to spend time with everyone ahead of whatever it's a raise or a sale um, usually multiple meetings over a six month period. Um, and then I'm, you know, I share, share bits of information, but not everything about the business. And then when I go out to capital raise, I really try and organize the time. So I'm seeing the majority of them in the first week that I think are most likely going to give us a term sheet, uh, on the fundraising side, or most likely to buy. And then once I get someone who's interested, then you can kind of run like a, a, a more competitive process it means sort of taking it wider, I guess. Uh, but in this day and age, I guess there's bankers everywhere that sort of run that process for, on an exit. Definitely. And depending on the type of business and different bankers that specialize in different types of businesses and different size businesses as well. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So tell me what happens next. You sell your first business. What did you do next? I really wanted to come to America. I think like I had visited um, New York once <laughs> before and uh, it was kind of, I guess, a crazy thing to do in the sense that I didn't really know anyone when I moved here. But um, I I thought that had I have received the capital on my last company and had like a nurturing community, um, I would have maintained and I probably wouldn't have sold it. And so I realized if I'm going to do it again, I want to do it in a climate where there were supportive investors and people that could help grow the business. But I also realized that the population of Australia is basically the population of Los Angeles. So if I was successful, I'd have a way bigger impact doing it in the US than I would in Australia. Um, and that was kind of the thinking. Uh, so, you know, I got myself here, I got a job here. And then I met um, Kenny Lira, who had was starting Lira Ventures at the time, and he introduced me to his son, Ben Lira, um, and Ben was running Thrillist Media Group. Uh, and so I met Ben and a bunch of other like media tech guys, and, and I wanted to work for Ben, and that's where I ended up. And then what happened? Then I think I went in as a consultant of some kind. I can't remember exactly how I went in, but in the end, I was sort of running marketing for Thrillist, and that was a really amazing opportunity. It was really thriving at that time. We had just acquired Jack Thread's e-commerce platform, And so there was just a lot of really cool things happening. And I think the most interesting thing was I would always get, and, you know, Ben's such a, you know, open and generous person. So all of the, you know, old magazines and the Condé Nast guys, like, how do we do what you're doing? And so we would actually spend a lot of time with like traditional media companies teaching them. And then also if Ben was looking at investing things, I would meet with them and we could test products or run ads for them and, you know, start to see and give them, you know, data and feedback. And I really loved like that community and and that opportunity. Um, And so it was a really, it was actually a really cool time in my career. What inspired you to start your next business, Uni? Yeah, so I then left and started another business and, you know, but with Uni, I think you become obsessed with problems. And so I became obsessed. One third of single use plastics comes from the personal care industry. Um, It's a very solvable problem you know, people think it's more complicated than it is. It just requires probably more capital and, and, and more innovation. But 
for me, it was like, there is a better way to do this and no one's doing it. And so I wanted to try and find a way to prove that I could do that. Um, it's complicated in the sense that consumers today don't really care that much about sustainability in the US. And so for us, we had to have like a competitive product, a competitive brand and aesthetic and, you know, price and all of these things. And then once we got the customer, we sort of teach them about the sustainability. So I kind of call it guilt-free luxury, which is like, you know, our product is best in class, but also by the way, it's super sustainable and it can teach you how to do things differently. So I wanted that challenge. I was super excited about the challenge of building a brand. I also love doing the e-com work at Thrillist and I've always wanted to build a brand. So this was kind of my moment. And um, at the same time, I was also looking at sunscreens and I was just very interested in the category. Um, and you become obsessed enough and I spoke to enough people and my process and in terms of starting a business was go to investors and go to people that you want to hire and say like, if I build this, will you join me? And can like, you know, what, what kind of salary do we need to talk about? And then the other thing was going to investors and being like, if I do this, will you back me? Will you put me in your hotels? Will you, you know, support my rollout and things like that? Um, and I had got enough conviction on those two things. And that's when I started. How long did it take you to, you know, have those conversations and get those commitments and buy-ins that your community and these relationships you'd built over the over the years that they were going to be in if you decided to move forward and do it? Yeah, I was pretty casual. Like I would start to, you know, catch up with people I thought would be influential for the business. So I'd probably say like I was thinking about it alongside other businesses. Like I knew I was going to start something else. I would say like three to six months, depending on, you know, when I if I took it more seriously, I would have done it probably in three months, but I was kind of just feeling it out. Do you remember the day you were like, okay, this is happening. I'm going to do it. I got far enough that I kind of started to put the concept together and I met our creative director, Mark Atlin. And I remember I sat in his, I, first of all, I found out he lived in Los Angeles and I just moved to Los Angeles. So I was like, this is meant to be kind of thing. And I went to Kith, I was buying a present for my stepson and um, they had the Comme de Garçons perfume bottles. And I remember like my siblings having that, you know, 20 years ago. And I was like, wow, this guy's like created something that's like still culturally relevant, you know, 20 years later. Then I found out he lived in, then I just wanted to meet him. So I got into his living room and I was selling him. And I think that was the moment that I realized I wanted to do it. What were some of those next steps that you took to start building the business? I knew the design was the most important thing. So I wanted to find like a best in class person to do that, that really understood it. And so like for me, once, once Mark decided, I kind of in that room, I went in from, Hey, I'm going to tell you about what I'm doing to actually like really aggressively pitching him. And then once he agreed to do it, I was like, I guess we're doing this. And that's kind of how it started. Talk to me about the process of building a brand where you're now disrupting in industry, you're having to change people's behaviors of how they typically buy personal care products, and you're having to actually develop the the products and, you know, work with, I'm assuming you're working with specific, like new manufacturers, like, and you hadn't done this before. Like, how did you figure everything out and, and do it? I think you kind of get to a certain place and then you realize you need help kind of thing. So like, you know, Mark made these amazing designs and then we're like, okay, now we need to manufacture it. And so, and the same thing on the formulation side. Um, and that's where I just really relied on referrals in the community. So I would, you know, in the beauty industry, I went to anyone that had worked at a beauty company that I knew and said, do you know anyone in formulation? Do you, you know, uh, you know, or do you know any packaging designers and or manufacturers? So the more that I just reached out to people, they would connect me with someone and then I would spend time with them. And so um, I would say early on, everything was very heavily referral based or I would find through research and then I'd look on LinkedIn, who knows them? And then I'd ask them to, you know, introduce us. Um, but yeah, I kind of just figured it out as I, as I went. Yeah. What is the hardest part about creating these formulations for these new products? I... I guess have been in like the tech world for so long. So you can change things, right? So for us, you know, with a download, like we would basically launch a product at 80% and then we're watching what people did. I think like the difference with us is like you have to wait for everything to be in, you know, even the secondary pack, the inserts, you know, all of these sorts of things. It's such a, a final moment and you kind of have to wait for all of it to come in before you can launch. 
And then if I want to change something, it's such a long process to like make those changes. So I think in the real world, you have to be more patient and do more testing early on because it just takes such a long time if you want to change something. Um, and that's kind of a shock to me. So now I, now I spend a lot of time on our website just so I can get that, you know, instant feedback that I love so much. Um, but we're definitely spending more time and releasing less products. Mm -hmm. What was your launch strategy when you first went to market? I was very fortunate in Marissa, who was at Drunk Elephant before, joined our team. And she's so amazing in terms of, you know, creating buzz and obviously with the support of Susan and, and the girls at lead. So we really wanted just people to experience it. And like, we were shocked, like on the day that we launched, I mean, we did send it to, you know, a lot of people, a lot of our friends, and we put a really good list together, but the quality and the amount of people that came out to support us, like very instantly kind of had this like, you know, echoing effect. Um, and I think like, Within the first three days, some of the biggest beauty companies in the world and biggest venture groups in beauty reached out to me directly that we like ended up amplifying. So it was really through asking people to share. And to be honest, I think the thing that I say to a lot of people when you're launching a new company is like the message came from me, which is like, Hey, I'm doing something I spent a long time doing. It. I'd really love if you could like look at it. I didn't ask them to share it, but I was like, I just would really love your thoughts. And like, we want feedback and like, we just really appreciate you. And thank you so much for like, you know, accepting our gift basically. And I think that that does go a long way. Absolutely. Did you send out a lot of like products to influencers or, you know, other people that, that really helped on the, with the launch? Yeah. So I think we went to, I think it was like three, around 300 people. I could be wrong, but it was somewhere around that. And it went from influencers, friends, friends of friends. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think I sent it to every acquirer and I wrote, looking forward to working with you. So <laughs> I just thought, you know, it's quite good to get on their radar. Um, on and day so one. <laughs> up, up from day one. And then, you know, I thought maybe if they checked us out, then they would see that, you know, you know what we were doing. So um, yeah, I definitely gifting was a big part of our launch. No, I love, I love hearing that. So tell me about the process of capitalizing this business. Did you raise venture capital for Uni? No, not really. Okay. Um, so we did everything on safes. I think there's like a lot of good and bad around, you know, safes versus convertible notes or price rounds and everything. So my first investor who had invested in my previous business, big supporter of mine, was like, you need to do it as a safe. I won't do a convertible. And I was like, okay, great. So then like we kind of, you know, over lunch, like decided on a price. We negotiated a little bit. Um, and then I kind of went out and the day that I met Mark, I had to go into contract with him, you know? And so that day became very real. We needed money very quickly. And then that's when I started like sharing it with other people and said, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Um, would love for you if, if you're interested. Could we spend some time together? And that was really how we started that first fundraising process. And then once I had designs from Mark and we had samples, then we went out to people who were like more strategic. Like for us, it's like, you know, retailers or it's, um, you know, hotels or people who are in restaurant chains, you know, because we put uni in all the restaurants and hotels and things like that. So I wanted to know if I built it that they would distribute or something like that and support us. Um, and part of that process, I was very fortunate in the sense that um, – Guy Osiri and Ashton Kutcher were creating a new impact fund. Um, and part of their LP strategy was to bring in these strategic groups. So it was very aligned. Um, and they were one of the people that I went to when I was thinking about starting and asking if they would help. And um, they were like, we're not investing pre-launch. <laughs> we're not investing on a piece of paper, but if you build it, come back and like, maybe we will. So um, I knew Guy quite well, but I didn't, I'd never really met Ashton and it was during COVID actually. And so I sent them all the products and um, and, and showed them all the designs. And, and I was very fortunate in the sense that, you know, they invested. And once you kind of get someone with the clout that they have, you can kind of waterfall a little bit. Explain to those who don't know what that means. Like once you do get an investor like that and you're able to waterfall it, what does that mean? When you do safes, it's really great for the founder because you don't have to wait, you know, two, three months for it to close. So then that way, once you get one person in other people clothes on a per um, investment basis. So 
for instance, if I meet someone and we're open and around and they said, okay, we're, you know, love it. And I'd be like, okay, great. Like, could you sign and wire? You could potentially get them to sign and wire in the same day, which for startups who need capital, it's very valuable. Um, also there's no, like we use a Y Combinator term sheet. Like you don't really need to spend a lot of money on lawyers. It's a very quick, easy, friendly way to do it. The only caveat I would say is like, just keep track of the interest rates because if you keep, if you keep stacking safes, it could end up hurting you, you know, down the line. Um, and then what I mean by waterfall is everyone's very interested until one person invests. Once one person invests and like, it's all social proof, right? So once they get the one, then all the other guys are like, okay, okay, you've got to price this person's in. Someone's due diligence to, to some degree. Um, the more credible that person is, obviously, the more they feel like they've due diligence to, and then you can go to the, everyone else. Can you share what you're currently seeing in the market right now with the fundraising landscape and what you've learned over the years from, from raising? Yeah, sure. So I think... In beauty in particular, I guess we're like halfway between tech and beauty. You know, the, I think the multiples have come down on the exit side. So for us, like we really look a lot at, you know, what, who's being acquired and, and if it's like a multiple on revenue or EBITDA or, you know, things like that, that are markers in terms of setting the valuation. So I feel like naturally, you know, some you know, have gone down. Um, and then with that, as a result, valuations have gone down. I still feel like the funds have a lot of money and they needed to deploy the capital. So I don't think, I don't think less deals are necessarily getting done. I just think valuations are, you know, probably falling. But if you have a good business at a good price, you will get funded. Um, is, is really my thoughts. And, and something we were talking about, you know, before we started recording was I, what I've noticed from when I last went out for a major fundraising round, which probably like five, six years ago. Um, the mandates were used to be very broad and now they're getting very specific um, in terms of the prices, whether they can lead or not, the minimum check sizes, but also th- certain things within the category. Um, and I guess people are trying to carve that out so they're not competitive with other funds. But what it ends up meaning is like a lot of people who want to do the deals can't do them. And so my hope is that that will become more broad and less specific over time. What do you think has to change for things to actually change? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, it's just a cyclical nature. I think everyone was really broad, but then it was too, you know, they weren't really narrowing in on a particular thing and they were probably competing against too many funds. But now they're so specific that they've carved out their niche, but that also means that there's certain deals that they can't. So I think it'll just like level out over time as people do their, you know, next next funds. What would you say is the craziest thing that has happened to you since starting your business or in business? Probably the craziest thing with Uni was we got one of the fast companies most innovative, which is just like the other people that were on the list were just, you know, I mean, you know, chat GBT and, you know, all these kind of like amazing people who are changing the world. Like the fact that we were even in the room, you know, with them was, was really incredible. Um, and it was just kind of cool to see that like actually maybe what we set out to do is possible and we are having an impact. I mean, we, we try really hard, obviously, in what we're doing, um, but it's nice to know that someone's like watching, I guess, uh, and that so, like hopefully over time other companies will mimic what we're doing and, and really change the sector. That's so amazing. Congratulations. That is such such an accomplishment, especially when you think yeah, back so cool. to like just having this idea years ago and knowing it was going to be really hard and you wanted to make an impact and you went out and did it. And then, you know, getting that recognition must feel amazing. Yeah. And also like, it's, I think it's hard. We are a startup. I've only been in market for, you know, 13 months. And so when I'm pitching these big corporations, like having this thing actually means a lot because we're like, look, what we're doing is real. And like, you know, it really validates what we're doing. And so I would say it's like had a huge impact on our business. Absolutely. Awards and recognition are so important. We created this past year, the Entrepreneurista 100 Awards, because we wanted to create something to help validate women business owners, because these awards mean so much, whether you're pitching business or fundraising, just having that, you know, stamp of approval is is so important. So I I know how, how beneficial it can be. So big congrats on that. Yeah, no, thank you. I really appreciate that. How big is your team now? So where, um, I think also maybe this is pretty standard up, but I keep everyone on, even though they're equity holders, I probably have like a bigger equity pool we have a 20% equity pool for the team because I don't have a business partner. 
Um, and so everyone still had equity, but they were consultants, right? So it was just easier and more flexible for the business. Now we're in the process of hiring everyone full time. And that's one of the things you need to do before you kind of go into like a major fundraising round or a series A is you need to have everyone, their innovation, their contracts, like everyone kind of like signed up. Um, and so full time, we're now six. Amazing. Are there specific business tools or solutions that you've used that have really helped you in your business, managing your team, managing the back end and day-to-day of the business? Sure. I mean, I actually, most of the time I always ask, you know, people who run multiple businesses or the CEO of multiple businesses, I kind of say like, hey, what management tools are you using? Because I just like, don't, I don't feel like, you know, I've ever really nailed that down. But um, I use Asana, which I don't think is like revolutionary, but it kind of gives everyone an idea of what's going on. I would say Figma's really changed our world in terms of design feedback. I used to like spend a lot of time with art directors and designers, but I couldn't I'd have to sit there and ask them and point and ask them to change where now I can copy it and change it all myself. So I feel like the design process has been like sped up as a result of Figma. And then recently we started using ARPU for our subscriptions. We have a really high subscription rate um, and a big subscription business. And ARPU with Shopify allows you to like kick out your subscription. So if someone doesn't want to refill, it's like, I want to, in, you know, kick it out 30 days or two months or three months or I'm not ready versus like before they'd have to like log in, change, and then they'd end up getting too much product and they'd be annoyed as a customer and then, you know, and churn. So I think ARPU as a new tool has like actually like a lot of legs and, and will be, I'm sure, grow to a great business. Well, we will definitely link out to all of those recommendations in the show notes below. And I did not know about that tool for subscription. So I love yeah, asking this question because cool. I'm always learning yeah, about new cool. new tools as well. So thank you for, for sharing that. It's funny in tech, everyone shares everything. And I remember doing a founder's dinner in LA and we were all sitting around. And I was like, here's three ways that I'm like acquiring customers. that's giving me like an impressive cat kind of thing. And everyone looked at me like, why would she say that? You know? And I think like, I was like, none of us are really competitive. Like it's a big market kind of thing. And it was like, it's really funny. And in the beauty world, they're not as open, but in the tech world, everyone's always swapping notes and like helping each other. All right. So let's swap notes right now. Or really, you tell everyone all of your secrets. What are the best ways to acquire customers right now? What is working, especially in a subscription business? Yeah, I think it changes a lot. I mean, like we're doing a lot of whitelisting at the moment. So we organically gift a lot. And then on TikTok, as those perform, we reach out and then we basically, you know, whitelist or put money behind their handles. Um, and that's obviously working really well for us. Uh, we're also spending more time on like Reddit, LinkedIn, Pinterest, like really diversifying and moving off. I would say another really easy thing is like Google shopping. Like, if you're doing consumer products, if you just put your product in a lifestyle, not in like a, a like in, you know, white wall, white box kind of thing, then you'll definitely get more conversions. So they're just like, you know, a few little tidbits of things I that love work. That. Are you on Amazon as well? Um, we're not on Amazon. Not no. Amazon. Okay. So yeah, love hearing all of the the marketing tips and trends that are working. Obviously, we were talking before running an agency business, you know, things just are changing all of the time and you really have to be able to, you know, not put all of your eggs in in one basket because we all saw what happened two years, was that two years ago now with with Facebook, you know, things can change quickly. And if you have uh, all of your budget going into to one spot, it can be a little dangerous. So always good to hear. Yeah, we launched after the change. So yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it was an, <laughs> an annoying thing. Actually, my husband did the the commercial for Apple about around the privacy. So I kind of knew it was coming before it hit. Yeah. <laughs> good to have that, uh, the, that back at, I mean, I couldn't do anything about yeah. it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you just, you just knew about it. <laughs> yeah. He's like, it's so funny. You know, I was like, I don't think you need to tell, you should tell anyone that. Yeah. What would you say has been the hardest part about being a founder? I often say it's like a sickness because. You're so obsessed with what you're doing. It's 24 seven. No one else will ever be responsible for it. And so I really tell people like, don't do it. If you're looking just to flip something or whatever, it, it, it requires such commitment. And unless you're obsessed with it, then just don't do it kind of thing. And I think that's really, you need to have that, that gene, but I think it's like, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. I totally agree. I say it's like, we, Courtney and I say like entrepreneurista addiction. It's like, you just 
just crave it and love it and, and want to keep going and totally agree with what you said. You really have to be passionate about what you're building because there are ups and downs, highs and lows literally every day for a minute to minute or hour to hour that if you don't absolutely love what you're doing and have that mission behind it, it would be very easy to just stop and give up. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that that's why these podcasts are so important. It's just like, just keep going, you'll get through it, you know? And I think that like, sometimes it's just really nice for people, you know, and I sometimes see it on social media as well, which is like, this may look really great, but there were times, you know, when it wasn't. And I think you just got to, no matter what it is, just like, keep going, you'll figure it out kind of thing. Totally. Yeah. I think we say at the beginning of this podcast on the intro, it's not as glamorous as it looks on Instagram, but with a community around you and the resources and support, like anything is possible. You can absolutely do it and you should. Like, don't be scared, but just know it's not that easy. <laughs> Definitely. Can you share more about the products that you sell? And, you know, I th maybe a lot of our listeners don't know about Uni and tell me all the details of what you offer and who loves your products. Sure, of course. So for us, I really, you know, typically body care is like soap with like a synthetic fragrance. Um, so it doesn't really have any performative value. And so for us, you know, we wanted to create a hand wash that was so hydrating, you wouldn't need hand lotion and the same thing with like a body wash. And then I created a body serum, which is really, I never used moisturizer on my body because I didn't like the way that it felt. And so I use like an after sun, uh, which was typically made out of like aloe vera. And so what I did was I took a face serum base and I put all of the things that I put in, the, I had in the, my Australian after sun into the product. And so it's like a super, it delivers 24 hour hydration. But one of the things that people don't really realize is actually it's all made from upcycled, you know, ingredients. And so we took the ups, the oil from the olive oil industry and the pips and ground it down. And so we really like upcycle olive oil as our bases um, and then also the active ingredients comes from like marine ingredients. We make sure it's sustainably farmed. So we really look at like the life cycle of everything from beginning to end. Also, all of our formulations, um, are not only reef safe, but land and waterway and reef safe. And so, you know, we really kind of look at every different element. So consumers often see like really performative, beautiful smelling, cool looking product, but actually what they're getting is like a completely sustainably sourced product that's made from upcycled ingredients that can be like refilled and, and also recycled. Um, and also I think like, I think the biggest unique point about our business is we take the bottles back. So if you want to, you can send them back in the box. We give you a return label and soon you'll have bins that you can, you know, drop them off to. And when you get that, you know, you, we get those bottles back, we wash them and we refill them. So we're, we're also like a closed loop solution. That's amazing. What was it like figuring out all of the back end logistics of building that? I think. It's funny, everyone kind of, I mean, Mark thought I was crazy, you know, when I first said it. And so did a lot of people in the industry, but it's actually more cost effective for me to wash a bottle than it is to procure a new one. So when there was an aluminum shortage, I think all the beauty groups were like, hang on, what did that girl, crazy girl say again, you know? And then they all sort of started to reach out. But I think if you have a vision and you have critical thinking behind it and good people, they'll just figure it out. And so we just... The more people I talked to, we just found a way to do it. I knew the milkman did it at some point. So like it had to be, it had to be a solution. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was an achievable problem. Everything's figure outable, right? <laughs> yeah. You can, with the right people for sure. Totally. Totally. If you had 10 times the budget that you have right now to spend on marketing, where would you be spending? I would probably double down on like the IP. I think that there's a lot to do in like sustainable green formulations. Like how can I create the same performance, but in a way that has like no impact. Um, so I'm pretty obsessed with that. And that's probably what you'll see more on like the goop side. And then I think on like the packaging side, I really want to create like a deposit based system so I can encourage people to return bottles. Uh, and then also like, how can they use those points and continue to kind of build that loyalty um, where they can kind of see the change. At the moment, I, I plant coral. So I have like uni coral gardens that you can see. And I think it's in social media and things like that. So people can see as they like support uni, our, our physical coral garden is growing. Um, and so I just like love these ideas of like people actually seeing the good karma that they're creating by switching to uni. When you have a new idea for something in the business, what is your process to figure out if you should actually start and execute that idea or put a pin on it and not work on it yet? 
I will usually like sideline on the product development or on the design side and I will get it to a point where I can like pitch it back to Marissa or someone else on the team and be like, okay, so like, you know, I kind of just did this little project and I think we should look at it. And usually that's kind of how it starts. I don't try and like have a big group meeting and strategize. I kind of just come up with an idea, flesh it out. And if it's any good, then I'll take it to the team. What are you most looking forward to this year in the business? I'm excited. We're starting to put uni in a lot of restaurants and hotels, and I'm excited just to, you know, start seeing it come to life. I had a friend the other day who texted me a bottle of like uni in a retail store. And I was like, where is that? And they're like, oh, it's the Goop store on Bond Street in New York. And I had no idea that I was in that store. And so I knew that they were selling us online, but I didn't know we're in retail. And like, that was like a really cool moment, you know, and seeing it somewhere, I didn't place it. Um, So I'm excited for people to like start seeing it organically, you know, in the way that I have. That's awesome. How do you manage your time with building this business? And I assume you at least take some time for yourself as well. (laughs) I don't take as much time for myself, but I think that I love what I do. So I don't think it's like, you know, a bad thing. Um, But yeah, I, I don't think I have an amazing management tool at the moment. I think like everyone else, like I started this business, it was basically, I was the only first full-time employee, you know? And so I did everyone's job and I think it's better, more about hiring great people and giving them more control. Um, and so it's cool that now the business is, you know, making money and in full flight that I'm able to like recruit the people that can kind of take projects off my hands so I can do more of the things that I love. Do you have a go-to interview question that you ask to know someone's going to be a really great fit for the team? I think I kind of usually don't really ask a question, but I always give projects. So I like to understand what someone's thinking. So I will find something that I've already found the solution for. Um, I don't want to use someone's work to like, you know, for our business. So I want to do something that we've already fixed, but I wanted to see how they thought about it. And did they get to the same solution or a better solution on what was their critical thinking to that path? Um, and so I've never, I actually had to do a project at Thrillist and I guess that's where it came from. Um, and so I always give projects to people before I hire them. Do you remember what the project was that you did to get hired at Thrillist? I actually don't, but I remember like, I remember going in there and was like, damn, I spent like four days on this thing. You know, (laughs) I was like, I really over indexed. I obviously really wanted to do it, but, um, I remember thinking like, this is really, I remember being very happy with myself, uh, on the project. Is there a piece of advice that someone has given you in your entrepreneurista journey that has really made an impact on your trajectory? I think there's two things that I come across. Like I, I think a lot of people think that they need more money than they do when they're starting a business, you know, and I have people who like pitch me like, yeah, I need 3 million to do this thing. And I was like, no, you don't. You probably need like 250 grand for the first 12 months, you know? And so I think that there's like this hurdle and like, yeah, but I need to pay myself. And I was like, I haven't paid myself, you know? And so I think that there's certain things and sure, of course, like some people obviously need the pay, but you really don't need that much money to get it to, you know, that first stage. And I really encourage people to like not try and go into the venture world and just try and get, do as much as they can on their own because then they'll learn more and they'll probably be a better operator. So I think that's probably the biggest thing that I sort of say to people in terms of like advice that I've gotten. Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing is you have to separate yourself from the company. Like, I think that I see sometimes like Uni is an extension of me, but really it's now like a beast that is outside of me. And it's really important to like keep that, you know, um, distinction. Is there a mantra or quote that you just live your life by? My husband's mother, I think it's like a Churchill thing. And she's like, you just got to keep on buggering on kind of thing. And I think that that really like sticks with me. It's like, you just got to keep going. You know what I mean? No matter what it is, you just got to pick yourself up and keep going. And, um, and so I always, I guess I kind of live by that, you know, yeah, just keep so going true. kind of, yeah, I'm quite relentless. So like, I think that I definitely probably my mantra. I think you, I think you have to be in business. You know, you just have to keep going. When you just said that, it just reminded me, my daughter, have you ever watched Finding Nemo? The movie Finding yeah, Nemo? Of course. So the yeah. door says, just, just keep, I think she just keep swimming, just keep swimming. But that's like, that's entrepreneurship, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. AK, final question for you. What does being an entrepreneurista mean to you? 
Oh, I think it's it's sort of one and the same. It's kind of resilience, you know what I mean? Like, I it's funny. Like in the fundraising process, someone was like, "You can't go out to too many people because rejection's so you know hurtful," you know. And I was like, "Yeah, but you also like you need to know other. You never know if someone could be really interested and could be really strategic, you know." And I think that like the more you do it, the more resilient you are. And I think that that's yeah, what it kind of means to me. Absolutely. Resilience is absolutely everything in, in business and entrepreneurship. I am so excited to, I need to try your products. I've not Yeah, tried we your need products, to get so your product. Definitely. I am so excited. And thank you so much for spending the, the afternoon and sharing more about your journey and story. It's so helpful to hear all of these learning lessons that you just shared. And I'm excited for our entrepreneurs to discover your products now. Where can everyone find you, follow you for those that are interested in trying Uni? Where should they head over to? Sure. We, I think our, well, our URL is we are uni. It's like the sea urchin uni.com. Um, and then we're also in Erewhon and Goop. So there you go. Amazing. Well, we will be linking out to everything in the show notes below. So if you want to try uni, head over to the show notes and you can click through. AK, thank you so much again for being here. No, of course. And thank you for all that you do. This is amazing. And I'm so happy to be a part of it. Love, love doing this and, and helping others, as you know. So thank you again. I'm Stephanie, and this is the best business meeting I've ever had.